Well, good morning, church family. Welcome to Christ Fellowship Eastside. We're so glad that you're here. Good morning, Andrew. It's good to see you. Um, it's good to see the rest of you as well. It's beginning to feel a lot like summer these weeks, um, and the, the weather is changing. Um, school is coming to an end uh, shortly, if it hasn't already for you. And I love seasons of change because they just bring new opportunities uh, and new opportunities to uh, live in God's will, to wait on Him for His timing, to thank Him for His goodness, and to worship Him for He is good all of the time. If this is your first time here this morning, we want to welcome you. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. Hopefully you got a guest card on your way in. Uh, we'd love for you to fill that out, basically just some name and contact information, because we want to follow up with you. We want to get to know you, um, understand uh, your story, hear your story, share our story with you, and basically just build a relationship, um, and thank you for being here. We have a small gift for you um, in a blue bag uh, in the back, and so if it's your first time here, thank you for coming. We're so glad you're here, and we'd love the opportunity to connect with you um, later on this week and in the coming weeks as well. At Christ Fellowship Eastside, we exist to multiply disciples to the glory of God. We do so by living connected, by pursuing Christ and sharing good news, and we'll do those things even this morning as we worship our God who is always good. So I'm going to open with prayer, and then I'll invite you to stand together, and we'll sing. God, we love you so much. We're thankful for who you are and what you've done. Lord, this morning, would you fill our hearts with joy and peace? Would you fill our hearts with satisfaction uh, that only you can provide? Lord, would you allow us to see past the things that are in front of us, the things that are on our minds and on our hearts this week, uh, this month even, Lord, and, and, and just see your glory and see your plan at work in our lives. And Lord, give us strength and grace to trust in your plan for our lives. Lord, we love you. We praise you. It's in your name we sing this morning. Amen. Would you stand together as we sing, church? is the battle he sees our victory when all i see is the battle you see my victory
for a God who is for us. To give it praise, church. Search the world. Oh, I've searched the world. And it couldn't fill me. No man's empty praise, treasures of faith, but never enough. Till I met Jesus, then you came along. And you put me back together. Awesome God who does awesome things, and there's no one like him. There never was, and there never will be. And we have hope because of his son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Galatians 2 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's a good thing because it's not about our, it's not about our, our works. It's not about our hopes and dreams. It's not about us striving or, or, or attaining or achieving. It's all about Jesus Christ and what he's already done. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself 
for me. I want to sing a song this morning that we've done before, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me, packed with theology. Don't let these words just pass you by. Think on these words. Let these words affect your heart as we sing this morning. See what gift of grace. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless love. Sing to this. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus for my life is holy bound to me. Oh how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me. Amen. The night is dark.
and love you and praise you this morning. We're thankful that the life we live is your life through us and your strength and your power and your hope. God, we love you and we praise you in your name this morning. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. We also believe that it needs the support of the body of Christ to be carried out in the most efficient and effective way. Today we have two families desiring to dedicate their precious new children to the Lord. If you would, would y'all come on up. Thank you. We have Danny and Dakota Beard with Kinsley, Avalyn, Riley, and Carson. Phil and Laura Thompson with Darcy May. Remember the prayer of Hannah from 1 Samuel 6? We've been going through the book of Samuel, and so I know it must be fresh on your mind. Hannah prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. In Eli's day, it may have looked a little different than, than today. I, I don't think Dakota and Laura are leaving these little ones in the gym and, and coming back a few times per year with some handmade clothes. But as parents who dedicate their children publicly, as Hannah did, these parents make the acknowledgement that children are a gift from the Lord and that their desire is that God will use their children in his kingdom and for his glory. In Ephesians 4, we have the Apostle Paul, after he <clears throat> chastises uh, dads for not provoking children, okay, he, he does say this, bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. And as we, as a church, want to commit to come alongside these parents in that work. Now, I'm going to ask the parents uh, to respond to some questions, <clears throat> and I will ask our congregation to do the same, and the, the answer is I will, or you could just go on home now, um, but that, that, that'll be the right answer. Okay, families, will you commit to train these children by your teaching, actively communicating the truth of God's word to them? Congregation, will you make the most of every opportunity you might have to come alongside these parents in communicating the truth of the word of God to these children. Families, will you commit to train your children by your example as you follow Christ wholeheartedly? I like this. Congregation, now, will you commit also to be godly examples for these children as you follow Christ wholeheartedly. One more, families. Will you pray for these children regularly and raise them in the fellowship of a church that obeys Christ and teaches his word? Congregation, will you pray for these children that they will come to know Christ at an early age? And will you pray for these parents as they seek to raise them in the fellowship of a church that obeys Christ and teaches his word? We're going to start that last one right now. Pray with me. God, we thank you for these young ones, Darcy and Carson, and we thank you that you've given them to their parents and the stewardship you've put over them to raise this image of you in the ways of you. God, would you see fit to take 
these young hearts, even these young hearts of stone, replace them with a heart of flesh that they might know and obey your statutes and that you would watch over them, call them to yourself and make them your own children. Father, as these parents strive to do this in pleasing you, may a day never go by where they don't hear the very word of God read to them every day. May it wash them, Lord, and their eyes be open to come and see you who for you, who you are. And may you grant repentance and faith to bring them into your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, we, we're thinking about changing up that slide, but for the David and Goliath story, we got to at least have the dramatic sound uh, one last time. So uh, here we are. Well, good morning, folks. I'm Phil, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship Eastside, and uh, we get to study this morning one of the most famous stories in the entire Bible. All right, I, I think back to even uh, kind of secular boardroom, classroom scenarios, and uh, even watching the news or watching sports, and you can't go anywhere without hearing uh, somebody talk about an underdog beating a larger team or nation or organization, and somebody is going to refer to that as what? A David and Goliath story, yes. And so that's what we get to look at this morning, and it's an impressive story that you might have heard explained in a number of different ways, and perhaps the way that we're going to handle this story is going to be a little different than you may have heard, uh, because there are two ways that are commonly used to approach this passage. Um, there, there are two ways that, that I think have some problems with them, and we'll try to chart a different path. The first way that it often gets approached is to externalize the story and to use it just in the way that I set it up a moment ago, which would be to say, you know, this story is all about how uh, God will often use the underdog. He'll, he'll use the, the guy that you would least expect to come through with an amazing victory. So are you the little guy? Are you the one who struggles to get a date? Are you the one that lacks financial resources? Are, are you that guy? Well, God's going to come through for you big time. Don't, don't worry, just wait your time. That's the Malcolm Gladwell approach to this passage. Um, you know, that, that feels really encouraging and uplifting. Said, so, yeah, I've got, I've got a shot at this. Um, and, and that might be encouraging for some of you. Um, but it's not really the point of the story because the context, if you remember our last chapter, is all about how God doesn't look on the outside. God doesn't care about what's going on the outside. He only cares about the heart. And so to focus it on the outside, the big giant versus the small shepherd or the modern armor versus the ancient sling, uh, is to miss the point. God has made clear that he doesn't look on the outside, just the heart. So the external approach is shallow at best. Uh, the other approach is to moralize this and to look at this and say, well, you know, we, we want to aspire to the bravery of David. You know, carpe diem, seize the day, run after the giants in your life, go take them down. God's with you. God's going to help you beat all the giants in your life. God's going to bless you and they will be destroyed. But really, when you look at this passage, there is something vastly unique about what's going on here. There's something very unique about the ministry and life of David, even the fact that he goes into one-on-one -on -one combat with Goliath. And in fact, even to, to, to moralize it in this way and say, you know, this is all about digging deep and really discovering yourself and your, your true identity and your bravery and your boldness. Well, you know who actually discovered that in this chapter as well? Goliath. <laughs> Goliath was big and strong and brave and, you know, went out into the valley too. So um, to, to moralize it in that way is to, again, miss the point of the story. Uh, so what I want to suggest this morning is probably a, a much more encouraging way to even think about this passage, and that is to look at the spiritual dimension behind this passage. And so we're going to read 
I know it's a long chapter, but 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Philistines gathered their forces for war at Soko in Judah and camped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Saul and the men of Israel gathered together and encamped in the valley of Elah, and they lined up in battle formation to face the Philistines. The Philistines were standing on one hill, and the Israelites were standing on another with a ravine in between them. Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet nine inches tall and wore a bronze helmet, the bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was a bronze uh, armor on his shins and bronze javelins slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam. The iron point of the spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. He stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formations. Why do you come out and line up in battle formation, he asked him. Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men. Have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight each other. Then Saul and all Israel heard these words from the Philistine. They lost their courage and were terrified. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem of Judah named Jesse. Jesse had eight sons, and during Saul's reign, he was already an old man. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war, and their names were Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab, the next, and Shammah, the third. And David was the youngest. The three oldest had followed Saul, but David kept going back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock in Bethlehem. Every morning and every evening, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand. One day, Jesse told his son David, take this half bushel of roasted grain along with 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. And also take these 10 portions of cheese to their field commander. Check on the well-being of your brothers and bring a confirmation from them. They were with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. When he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was speaking with them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. When all Israel, uh, all the Israelite men had seen Goliath, they retreated from him terrified. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, Do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make uh, him, the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. David spoke to the man who was standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The troops told him about the offer, concluding, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. David's oldest brother, Eliab, listened as he spoke to the men, and he became very angry with him. Why did you come down here, he asked? Who, who, who did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. What have I done now, protested David. It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him and to the others in front of him and asked about the offer, and the people gave the same answer as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul so that David was brought to him. David said to Saul, Don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But Saul replied, you can't fight this Philistine. You're just a youth, and he's been a warrior since he was young. David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. 
Then Saul had his own military clothes put on David and put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put, in, uh, put on armor. David strapped on his sword over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off, and instead he took a staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in a pouch in his shepherd's bag. And then, with sling in hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came closer and closer to David with a shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a youth, healthy and handsome. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine said to David, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. David said to the Philistine, you come at me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. Today, I will strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God, and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. When the Philistine started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put the, his hand in the bag, took out a stone and slung it, and hit the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. David overpowered the Philistine and killed him without having a sword. David ran and stood over him. He grabbed the Philistine's sword and pulled it from its sheath and used it to kill him. He cut off his head. When the Philistines saw their hero was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry, and chased the Philistines to the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Philistine bodies were strewn all along the Sharim road from between Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from their pursuit of the Philistines, they plundered their camps, and David took Goliath's head and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put Goliath's weapons in his own tent. When Saul had seen David going out to confront the Philistine, he asked Abner, the commander of his armies, "'Whose son is this youth, Abner?' "'Your majesty, as surely as you live, I don't know,' Abner replied. The king said, "'Find out whose son this young man is.' When David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with Philistine's head still in his hand. Saul said to him, "'Whose son are you, young man?' "'The son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem,' David answered. This is God's word." Uh, in this passage, we're going to see several things that we encounter here. Uh, we're we're going to see first what we encounter, how we respond, and what we need. The encounter, the response, and the need. So first of all, what do we encounter? We encounter immense evil in this passage. Uh, the presence of evil runs like a thread through this passage. You know, if you miss it, you miss the big point of what this passage is shooting for. This prophet that writes this book, uh, one of the prophets here for us, 1 Samuel, is, uh, is intending for us to look evil right in the eyeballs, to see cosmic evil in all of its grossness and hugeness. And so we see it all throughout this passage. First of all, it shows up personally in this passage. Um, there are several hints in this passage that what we're dealing with um, is a dark and demonic evil that is standing right there in the presence of the people of God. Um, several different aspects of this that we see. We see, first of all, the Edenic setting. Uh, first, the passage shows us where we're at. It's, it describes this place as the Valley of Elah in verse 2. Valley of Elah is a southern kind of gateway to the, the land of Israel, just like the um, uh, uh, Valleys would kind of give access militarily to a land, but they also became fertile places for lots of growth to occur. And so this is one of the agricultural regions of that time where a lot of growth would happen and a lot of uh, plants and fields would be harvested and so on. And so this was a fertile, rich soil that was watered well as, as water would come off, the rainwater would come off the Mediterranean and rain there. And so it was this fertile soil that had had these streams kind of flowing throughout it. Wadis are these kind of seasonal streams that would ensure that there was sufficient water uh, at, in the rainy seasons. And so you have this, this beautiful setting that the people of Israel find this battle taking place in. 
But secondly, we see this gigantic man that appears in the middle of this lush, beautiful area, this garden-like location. Uh, and depending on which text you have, it, it, it varies from probably between seven feet and nine feet tall, somewhere in there. The, the idea being, this guy is huge. He's a massive dude that shows up here on the scene. Um, it would, he, you know, even, even Saul, who stands head and shoulders over all of Israel, is intimidated by this big dude. And you want to know how big he is? He carries, it says, 125 pounds of armor. Everybody agrees on that. And that is a lot of weight. I uh, think about uh, the typical army rucksack is about 50 pounds or so. Um, and so imagine carrying two and a half of those around on your body at all times ready for war pretty impressive. This, this is an amazing dude that stands here. But not only is he a big dude, but big dudes show up at very important pivots in the history of the Bible. Even just looking back, uh, kind of the, the negative dark turns of Scripture, Genesis chapter 6, there's an appearance of these Goliath-like figures that show up on the scene as, as demonic forces are having their way on earth. And even in Numbers chapter 13, there are these spies that go into the land of Canaan. The people of Israel are wondering, should we go in and take God's promised land or not? We've been uh, out in the wilderness, and we're trying to figure out if we should cross over or not. And when they go to spy out the land, what do they encounter? Giants in the land. They encounter these big dudes in the land. What do they do? Their response is to turn away from God's promised land and go back out into the wilderness. Again, they're punished for their sin of rejecting God's good land because of the fear of these these giant monsters. They're freaked out by these evil, child-killing worshipers that have these giants on their side. This, uh, you, can, you can just see this, this darkness of evil that is pervasive in the land that they're about to enter. And so there at the great two great turning points of Old Testament history, we find men of unusual size, M-O-U-S's, uh, as it were, um, standing at those key critical moments. And then uh, another aspect here is, is this uh, armor that he wears. In verse 5, it says that he wore a bronze helmet and bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. The, the, the word for scaly there is, one of, uh, is a very rare word in the Old Testament, and it actually refers to exactly what you think, the, the scales of like a snake or a fish. Um, and, and that snake-like armor is what Goliath stands in as he confronts the people of Israel. He, he approaches them as this giant serpent-like figure, this Leviathan-like figure in the middle of a garden. Interesting. And then fourth, in verse 16, it says they were taunted by this man for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, on, on just a surface level, that's a long amount of time for this battle. You know, you got, you got a bunch of troops that you have to sustain them on either side of this ravine, and they're constantly just doing this dance for 40 days as this, this monster guy comes out every day and taunts them in morning and, and at evening. And so, the, but, but not only is it a lot of days, but the significance goes much deeper. Because at each of those two turning points in Israel's history, that number 40 is actually very significant. So what is it that God used to wipe away the giants of Genesis chapter 6 that showed up on the scene? Well, 40 days and 40 nights of rain. What was it that um, culminated in the discovery of the giants when in Numbers chapter 13, when they go into the land and they see these giants? It's 40 days of spying and accompanied on either end with 40 years of wilderness wandering on either side. So it's, it's a very significant moment here for the people. It's a, it's a symbol of God's testing of the people. What are, what's going to happen here in this critical moment? Are you going to pivot back into disobedience and there will be judgment? Or are you going to turn to my salvation and find rescue? And then there's the climactic end of the giant. His head is severed from his body, as every teenage boy loves the story of David and Goliath for. You can't skip verse 51. Um, and it, it actually echoes back to a story that we already covered in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Do you remember which story that was where there was a great decapitation? Anybody remember? There was, there was the story of the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of who? Dagon. Yeah, so... 
It's okay. It's okay. We're warming up. Um, so Temple of Dagon, God's presence through the ark is brought there. And time after time, this, this, uh, you get that night in the museum moment and, and the, the statue is found on the ground, then once with his hands off and then finally with his head off. And it's this, this moment of great humiliation for the people who had followed Dagon. And so here, here again, we see this great kind of godlike character that's on the scene with, with these uh, immense serpent-like, leviathan-like characteristics who's decapitated here at the end of the story. The head of the serpent is crushed in the valley of Elah after 40 days and 40 nights. So not only do we see the appearance of evil, but we um, encounter that immense evil in our reality. Um, what, what tends to be the case when we think about kind of the bigness of kind of um, spiritual warfare or uh, temptation or Satan or the forces of evil, we, we end up kind of abstracting that out of our reality. That's something that happens maybe in heaven, maybe that happens in some places that we don't like to think about uh, far away from my life, and it doesn't really touch the reality that I live in or have to deal with. But what uh, the writer of Samuel uh, wants us to consider is the fact that, that this dark evil is actually present right here in the here and now in the nitty-gritty of our lives. Because this story is actually one of the most detailed stories you'll find in the entire Old Testament. The, the amount of precise information that you find here is just incredible. I mean, you get the height of the giant, the weight of his gear, the exact words of his speech, the number of Jesse's sons who are at war. We get the, uh, the amount of grain and bread for his brothers. And you even get, uh, I love like the, the 10 pieces of cheese like, <laughs> randomly thrown in there. Um, and, you know, and, and that's for the commander. You know, they're, they're trying to you know, buy off some good position, you know, in the, maybe in the rear for his, his brothers so they're not you know, going to get killed in battle. You know, it, it's like all the little nuances of daily life are kind of woven throughout this passage. You get um, this, uh, he, he leaves his sheep with another person, uh, like no detail goes untouched. He interacts with the men and, and there's kind of repetition as he goes back and forth and dialoguing with these characters. I mean, all of this would take up a lot of room on a scroll here, and, but yet they record every single precise detail, the amount of stones, how he approaches the giant, the dialogue between the two, every detail of his death and the aftermath of the battle, every bit of it's recorded. Why on earth would he go to so much detail? to record every little tiny bit of information that we read? Well, two reasons. One, because it really happened in real space-time history. This is a real true event, and when real true events happen, there are all kinds of details that people will pick up on and notice and remember. And so all of that is recorded for us. But it's also recorded for us because we need to know that this kind of victory doesn't happen in some abstract spiritual realm. It happens in the physical here and now. This kind of cosmic battleground happens here on earth, in my life. Get this 58 verses packed full of vivid detail, because cosmic evil, spiritual warfare happens in our lives. It's in the nitty-gritty of the dishes to be done, the clothes to be folded, the reports to be filed, the commutes to be driven, the families to be cared for. That's where the serpent shows up and rears his head. So we've seen the evil that we encounter. So now, how do we respond to that situation? Well, we respond, unfortunately, to that kind of evil with immobilizing fear. In response to this kind of bigness of evil, um, we, we, well, we like to think, when we approach a story like this, and we talked about this in the kind of moralizing category, we like to think, well, I am surely going to be the one who, unlike everybody else, approaches my giants and my temptations and my spiritual warfare like David. Be like David. Man up. Be brave. Be strong. Go beat the giants. And, and so we want to place our story in the, uh, we want to write our story as the story of David. We want to have in the background playing, we are the champions or I have the tiger as we, you know, as we race toward the giant. But in reality, our part in this story, if you want to find where you fit in this story, where you and I fit, are with the people of God in this story. And what do the people of God do in this story? They hide, they're afraid, 
they're terrified, along with their self-selected leader, Saul, they can't do anything. They can't move forward. Forty days and forty nights stuck with this giant in between them. Verse 11, verse 24, you see this, this response. It says, when, uh, verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard the words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. You think, well, how dare they? <laughs> uh, I mean, when you're, when you're faced with a monster from, uh, with, from the forces of evil from beyond this earth, when you're, when you're faced with something that comes from the upside down, come into Hawkins, you better be terrified. Like, this is, this is not good. This is a bad scenario that's about to go down. And, and to, to look at them and say, wow, you know, how dare they, uh, I think it demonstrates a, a, an immense amount of arrogance on our part. They're encountering a sort of evil that should paralyze us, if we're honest. And so for some of us, we've, we face similar situations where we run into those immobilizing fears. Eventually, there'll be some form of temptation that will reach into your life, some kind of uh, immense evil that will break in and leave you paralyzed as well. For some of you, it may be a spiritual temptation, some kind of battle that you deal with uh, in regard to sin that just is absolutely unbeatable for you. You find uh, found ways to try to confront it, to pursue counseling, you've prayed, you, you've, you try to be consistent with your Bible reading, you're, you're part of a faithful, uh, faithful member of a church, You've done everything you can think to beat this sin, and you simply can't catch a break. And like the children of Israel, that what feels like 40 days and 40 nights stretching on to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the temptation just makes you say, I can't shake it. And for others of you, it might be uh, a looming mental health condition that just hangs on you like a fog. You prayed over it, tried different prescriptions, but it just won't lift. Or it might be some personal crisis, maybe a crisis even within your home or extended family where a dark evil has eclipsed your family. Everything that you hold dear is, is, is being contested. Your relationships with your kids, your parents, your extended family is at a breaking point and deep wounds have been afflict, inflicted. It, what, what used to be like a, a lush garden for you to enjoy is now the place that's contested by Satan. What do you do? Um, each one of us, when we are sucked into these places where we are confronted by spiritual battles, the forces of evil, where, where those who want to destroy our lives are present, um, often resort to our own devices, our own self-appointed leadership, resort to the armor of King Saul to fight those battles. And like Saul does here, dressing up David he finds himself completely inadequate to the problem. And just like that, we, we find our own willpower and our own resources uh, sufficient for a lot of things. I mean, if you think about it, King Paul, uh, King, King Paul, wow. I, I just uh, keep, keep mixing those guys up. Uh, it, it, but if you think about it, Saul had scored some victories wearing that armor. He had seen a lot of enemies defeated. He had been able to do some good things in that army, with his resources, doing what he knew how to do. But at some point, he reached the end of those resources. He reached the end of his line of success. And he couldn't beat this enemy. And so it will be with us. At some point, we'll reach our Valley of Elah moment where we're confronted by an impossible obstacle, something that's brought about by our great opponent, the one who stalks us like prey, who wants nothing more than to destroy our life, the serpent himself, Satan. And what do we do at that moment? What do we do when we find ourselves at that Valley of Elah moment, totally stymied, unable to move forward by, a, by an opponent that's so much bigger and so much more powerful than ourselves? Well, that's, that's the part I love about the story, is that we need an improbable Savior. This passage is meant to lift our eyes to get our, get our eyes not, 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 not just off of Goliath, not just off of the, the weak and immobilized forces of Israel, and, and to refocus us not just on David, but even greater, the son of David, that would bring into reality all that David stands for in this passage. The Holy Spirit superintended all of Scripture to connect these dots for us, 
to show us the hope that we need for an improbable Savior to step in, the one that would be shocking, the one that would be the least expected one to step in and save the day against the backdrop of huge cosmic evil. So I want to look at several parallels in this passage that show us a connection between David and Jesus. First, we get this story of David coming on the heels of chapter 16. What happened in chapter 16? He's anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel. And immediately it says, after his anointing, he is filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit, then there is 40 days of Goliath going on and confrontation with Goliath. What do we get with Jesus? At his baptism, he is anointed. The Spirit descends on him like a dove. And he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days, tempted, or is fasting before being tempted by Satan. Jesus steps into this pattern of David. As well, we get this idea of a substitute champion here in this passage. David enters this valley and does something for the people of Israel that they could not do for themselves. He enters and does one-on-one single combat with the great champion of the evil ones. He stands in their place and achieves a victory that they could not achieve for themselves. Because what, what the people of Israel needed was not a cheerleader. What they needed was a champion, one who could take their place and beat the enemy that they couldn't beat, one who would go down in front of them and take their place. Their self-chosen leader stood there shaking on the sidelines. We need one who, like Jesus in the the letter to the Hebrews, uh, tells us that he is the pioneer of our faith. He's the one who, who goes where no man has gone before. He goes out front. He descends into the valley of the shadow of death. And guess what? He comes out the other end victorious. That's who we serve in Jesus. We also see a movement from, from the camp out into disgrace. Again and again, verse 10, verse 25, verse 26, there's this theme that runs through this passage of the disgrace that Goliath is heaping on the people of Israel. Time after time after time, it says he is shaming the God of Israel. He's bringing insult and rebuke against the people of God. Time and again, that is is the move of Satan, is to rebuke and insult the people of God. He defies God. And so David goes outside of the camp to get what? Shame heaped upon him. In the midst of that shame, he shuts the mouth of the giant. And so too, Jesus, Hebrews 13, says he exits the camp and drinks down the disgrace. He is the the sponge of our shame. He is, as Matthew puts it, Mark puts it, there are these these two criminals crucified on either side of Jesus, and he uses, they use that same exact Goliath language to say that these these guys are the ones hurling the insults on Jesus. When, when Mark and Luke talk about how Jesus' parable of, of what the Jewish leaders would do to him and the way that they would uh, bring him to his death, they, they said that they would, they would hurl insults and rebukes at him. Jesus himself steps into the David-like story. He endures the cross, he despises the shame, and seat, sits down at the right hand of God on our behalf. He also approaches the enemy in weakness And this is part of that shame and defiance and insult against David. Uh, You look at his insignificant appearance. That's what Goliath insults about him. Look at his his young appearance. This this isn't a guy with battle scars or wounds or anything like that. This is is a young kid. And he he looks and sees not the sling probably behind his back, uh, but he sees that shepherd's staff out in front. Like, you're coming at me with a stick like you would a dog or something to drive a dog? Who are you? What are you doing? And just insults him because all he sees is the weakness and the frailty and the, the innocence of this little child that's coming at him. And so it is with the forces of evil as they looked on Jesus. As Jesus came and takes on human flesh, he comes without sword, without spear, Immortality has taken on mortality. God has become killable in the person of Jesus as he comes near to us. And all of hell's forces look on that and say, ah, we can beat that. 
And there is that sense in Scripture to, to which even the angels, it says, try to peer in and understand what God is doing in our salvation. And certainly the, the forces of evil trying to understand and wrap their heads around this say, this is our chance. This is our time to rise up and take control. We'll take out the sun and all will be ours. But it's a trap. The next thing is, is he comes, it says uh, in verse 45, he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of armies, Yahweh Sabaoth. I, I am coming with, with all of the armies of heaven behind me, but I come in his name. And ultimately, there is that sense where David comes in and bearing the name of God in one sense, that Jesus comes bearing the name of God in a way that is far deeper and far more significant than the first David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He bears the name of God, has the prerogative to claim the divine name as his own as he approaches the giant. As David expects global consequences, he says that all the earth may know that you are God, verse 46. He points, points people to, uh, this isn't just about me and Goliath. This is so that the assembly of God's people will know that God is a God who saves, and this is that the entire world would know that our God reigns, our God wins. And lastly, David defeats the enemy with his own weapon. David draws the sword of Goliath and lops off his head. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, Paul writes in Romans and 1 Corinthians that the, the greatest in, uh, weapon of our enemy, Satan, is death. The greatest in, uh, weapon that he has at his arsenal, at his, his disposal, is death. And that's the greatest thing that he can bring against us. And guess what? Death doesn't take Jesus. Jesus takes death. Jesus, Jesus absorbs the greatest weapon that our enemy has at his disposal and drinks it down and rises up victorious and takes that weapon up as his own. Jesus destroys Satan through death. As Colossians 2 puts it, he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed us and is taken away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. Jesus, like David, at the end of the story, you get this little glimpse of him outside the walls of Jerusalem. This is one of the early times that the city of Jerusalem is mentioned, um, at this time, occupied enemy territory. And it says he brings the head of Goliath there. And you can see him just wagging that in front of those city gates and says, you're next. <laughs> I'm coming for you. It's, it's an amazing story of his confidence that, that God is going to win, not just here in this battle, but he's going to take it to the holy city of Jerusalem, right in his backyard there in Bethlehem. He's saying, God is going to win. God is going to beat you. In a similar sense, Jesus stands outside the gates of Jerusalem, crucified, but yet crushing the head of the serpent, destroying Satan outside of the city of Jerusalem. So this morning, I want you to be encouraged. You may not have the boldness of David. You may not have his courage or strength or all those experiences in your background to lead you to a point where you can do amazing things for God. And I want you to know that that's okay. I want you to know that you have a David who has defeated Goliath on your behalf. You have the great son of David who has crushed the head of Satan. And this duel of the fates means that there are significant things that we need to consider. Um, two things as we go. First of all, look to the right champion. Um, you know, the, the people of Israel had that tendency to look to their own assumptions on how to deal with the scenarios that they found themselves in. They looked to their King Saul, head and shoulders above everybody else. This is the solution to our problems. But if you go that route in life and seek those solutions that are immediately accessible to you, you're going to end up in that spot where the Israelites found themselves completely paralyzed, completely unable to move forward because they've looked on the outward appearance and rejected the good shepherd who seeks to save their lives. Look to Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith, the pioneer of our faith. And secondly, fearlessly follow your champion. You say, well, Phil, you've you've just totally sucked out anything that we can do with this passage. Uh, You've totally taken out any kind of carpe diem moment for me that I really needed to go out and face the challenges of parenting, um, you know, those, those sweet cherubs on Mother's Day, um, and, and I, I have nothing here to apply. Well, guess what? If you put yourself in the right seat in this story, you have something incredible to apply here. Uh, verses 52 and 53 describe the people of God, once fearful, knees knocking on one side of that ravine, doing what? They're out there chasing the enemy all the way to their gates. They're out there plundering their camps and doing all kinds of amazing stuff. How did that happen? How do you move from complete paralyzation with fear to out there chasing the enemies? You have to see the one who beat the enemy in front of you. You have to be able to go down into the valley following the one that already beat the giant on your behalf. They capitalize on the victory of David. They're able to say, yeah, yeah, not... Uh, who, who won this battle? Yet not, not we, but David won it for me. Just like we sing, yet not I, but Christ in me achieves this victory. We run into the valley behind our great leader, our great champion. We're able to ransack the enemy and charge the valley because of the great pioneer of the faith who's gone down in front of us and beat the greatest enemy we could ever, ever face. In front of In comparison to the great enemy of death that's been defeated, all of those giants that we face are but grasshoppers. Every power that we face is puny in comparison. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the final enemy is death. And this is the enemy that's been crushed under the feet of Jesus. What more do we have to fear? Would you bow with me this morning as we reflect on this passage? This week, as some of you are reflecting and looking back or looking at the week ahead and the challenges that lay ahead for you, you may be feeling overwhelmed, even overwhelmed as you think of the task of parenting and raising up children to um, glorify God. It's it's an overwhelming responsibility, and you, you face in these tasks an immense evil that seeks to destroy to ravage, to ruin every good thing that God wants to do in your life and in those around you. And you feel paralyzed, as you probably should, if you think about it seriously enough. And I want to encourage you this morning. I just I want to lift up your hearts with the, the message, the truth that is prophesied for us here in 1 Samuel, that there is hope that we have a champion on our behalf who goes out and fights our battles for us. There is hope that you can charge into the valley, parenting, complexities in your work or marriage, that you can charge into that valley because there's one who's already won the war for you. And of course, if you're struggling with this and wrestling through these challenges, I want you to know that there is a church here that wants to come around you and pray for you. Because we're honestly like the people of Israel, knees knocking and not really knowing how best to deal with this ourselves, except in the power of our Savior, Jesus. We want to point your heart to him and encourage you towards him this morning. So as we sing toward the end, feel free to come grab me or someone who brought you to the service this morning and ask how how you can know that you have this champion, Jesus, on your behalf. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that it's not I who wins, but Christ. We pray that you would help us to to point our eyes to the one who is better, the true son of David, who's come to transform our lives and to give us the victory we can never earn on our own. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Appreciate that, Phil. I love the connection between David as being a type of Christ, as a as sort of a model of Christ, and that the, the victory that David is winning and the battle that David is fighting on behalf of, of the people of Israel is the, is, is the victory that Jesus is winning and fighting on behalf of ourselves. And so we'll go out this morning with the same admonition of looking to Jesus, who is indeed better. In verse 2 of this song, it says, Your kindly rule has shattered and broken the curse of sin's tyranny. My life is hidden neath heaven's shadow, your crimson flood 
covers me. This morning we'll go out singing, Jesus is better. Would you stand together as we sing? There's no other so sure and steady. There is no other so sure and steady. My hope is held in your hand. When castles crumble and death is fleeing, upon this rock I will stand. Upon this rock, upon this rock I will stand. Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of
Pastor Phil, would you close us? Well, thank you all so much for coming out on Mother's Day. And I uh, just want to let you know as you go, there will be some gifts for the ladies in the church. Mothers or not, um, there's a table on the back you can grab as you make your way out, uh, just as our way of honoring you. And thank you on this special day. And just by way of reminder as you go, uh, on the 21st, um, I think that's next Sunday, If it, all of May is just kind of merging for me. I don't know if it is for you. Um, 21st, we're having a quick parents huddle after the service, especially those that have kids ages five to fifth grade, just to, to strategize a little bit on what we're doing and some ways that we're seeking to serve those kids in that category, um, especially in the fall semester. Um, as, as we go, I wanted to remind us of some words from Romans. Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or has been his counselor, or who has uh, given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Church, the gospel goes with you. Have a good week.